Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. So this week is a, a very special episode because it's the first episode of the Learn by Doing initiative. It's a project where I'll be, I'll be implementing the actions and suggestions of the guests on the For Food's Sake podcast. Uh, usually in the form of seven-day challenges, um, and it's part of an effort to practice what we preach in sustainability. Um, so for this week's first episode, I've taken on J.B. McKinnon's 100-Mile Diet. Now, I interviewed James McKinnon, uh, who's the best-selling author of The 100-Mile Diet, uh, last week on episode four of the podcast. Uh, so be sure to check that out before listening to this episode to hear more about his experience with eating a 100-mile diet uh, a year long in Vancouver over a decade ago. Uh, now, in a nutshell, in case you, you've listened to the episode already, you need a reminder, or whether um, you don't have time to listen to the other episode, the 100-mile diet is a, a local diet where you eat only food that's produced within, you guessed it, a 100-mile radius of where you currently live. Uh, so the idea is that all your ingredients are supposed to come from with, within 100 miles. Um, and what that means usually is you immediately eliminate the kind of processed foods um, that you, you, you usually have as part of your diet, and naturally you usually end up with a diet that consists of mainly seasonal products. Um, so committing to a 100-mile diet uh, might at first seem like, a, like an absurd idea. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it seems impossible, uh, and it may even seem pointless. And surely in the, in the days leading up to the challenge, um, which I just completed, I thought to myself, uh, you know, it's the middle of the winter. Um, you've got no idea where you're going to get your food from. Pr- you know, practically all conventional supermarkets are off limits and you're working full time. You know, this is going to be too time consuming. Um, you know, you don't have the time to go visit the farms. It's practically impossible to get there with public transport. And so I really kind of leading up to this week um, of trying the 100 mile diet for myself. Um, I wasn't exactly sure I was going to be very successful. Um, now that I've completed it, uh, this episode is going to be all about kind of reflecting on my experience with the 100-mile diet and giving you some tips and tricks of what you can do to make your diet more sustainable and to incorporate more local, uh, local products into your diet. Uh, so the first thing that I realized um, before taking on this diet when I did a bit of research is that it's actually much easier than you think uh, today. Uh, especially more so now than it was 10 years ago when, when James tried the 100-mile diet with his partner in Vancouver. Um, so when I went online, um, I think it was last Friday, uh, within, within 20 minutes, I'd found you know, numerous organizations that cater to this type of, not necessarily a 100-mile diet, but definitely to a, a local diet. And one of the first organizations that really struck out for me and one that I that, that ended up being very helpful for making this 100-mile diet week uh, success was La Riche Qui Divi. Uh, La Riche Qui Divi is, a, is an online platform um, that exists not only in France, but as the food academy in the rest of Europe as well. Uh, and what it does is it brings together consumers in, in a city or in an area uh, with local farmers on an online platform uh, where you just click and select uh, essentially the foods that you want to order. It's very straightforward. There's a filter. Uh, you can filter whether you want you know, uh, organic foods, non-organic, if you want your meat, your dairy, um, vegetables, fruits, what have you, all, all seasonal, all local. Uh, you even get um, a recommendation of, of how far. Um, you, 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 can, you can sort by the amount of kilometers. Uh, how far the the farm is away from 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 where you are, and what happens is the farmers once a week they deliver uh, in the case of Paris to over forty distribution points within Paris. They distribute whatever's been ordered uh, to these distribution points, and all you got to do you pay online, and all you got to do is is go and collect it. Um, so it's a very it's it's a very intuitive um, system. Um, works really well. It's 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 a it's a social business. It's part of a, the L'Economie Sociale et Solidaire in, in, in Paris, uh, in France, which is basically a system in which an organization reinvests its profits uh, like a social business. Um, and there's a very, you know, there's a strong social and developmental focus to it. And so what I kind of noticed almost straight away was that this, you know, this, this diet seemed feasible. Um, it seemed like this week was going to be possible. I mean, 
you know, I did realize as well that um, it's part of a hundred mile diet. If you're living in a city like Paris, it does mean that for, you know, a week, you got to give up all condiments. So no sugar, no spices, no peppers. Um, alcohol is very limited. Um, you're also going to be limited to certain dairy products. And of course, you know, a lot of vegetables aren't going to be on display, um, especially if you're doing it in the middle of the winter. Um, but what I noticed um, is that instead of having this kind of enormous variety of vegetables, um, what you have instead is you have a more selective uh, set of, of, of vegetables, but much more, much more variety within them. So what I mean by that is, I mean, for example... Um, in your average supermarket, yes, you can buy maybe two types of mushrooms, but here, um, you know, it was totally incredible. Just one farmer, he was producing 13 different types of mushrooms. So it really kind of opens, I guess it brings a new perspective, um, to diet. Um, and so, you know, what I ended up doing, um, is I got really excited and, and, you know, I, I within half an hour of research, I, I, I signed up to La Riche Kidivi. Um, only to realize then actually that they don't deliver, uh, or I was too late actually for the delivery on the weekend. Uh, so here we are, uh, Friday night, I'm about to start the hundred mile diet and I don't have any food. So what do I do? Uh, the next day on Saturday, um, for the start of my weekend, I find another little cute little shop called Les Poireaux de, uh, Marguerite, uh, two little ladies, I guess one, one of them must've been Marguerite. Um, I had a small little shop in the in the center of Paris that sold local food. And I went there, I introduced myself, introduced the concept. Um, they didn't seem too phased. And so I ended up buying, what did I buy there? I bought lettuce, I bought fennel, uh, I bought carrots, um, I think I bought beetroot, Brussels sprouts, mushrooms, um, pears, garlic, baby potatoes, pumpkin, spinach, I mean, all sorts of, I, even local beer, I even bought local beer. Um, so it was a good start to the 100-mile diet. Uh, within the first two days, um, I got to admit, um, it was a little tough getting used to the fact that there uh, wasn't any salt in my diet, uh, getting used to the fact that, you know, my breakfast consisted of, you know, spinach and pears and, and lunch was, you know, a combination of uh, potatoes and carrots and lettuce and mushrooms. Uh, so it wasn't too exciting, frankly, to start off with. Um, but that all changed on Tuesday when my delivery of La Riche Kidiwi came in. Um, the ease with which I just, you know, was able to collect my food. I, I, I ordered a, a, a kilo of, of, of bread, um, a, a loaf of bread, um, shallots, leeks, spaghetti squash, butternut, uh, Belgium endives or chicory, whatever you call it. Um, six different types of mushrooms. Um, 250 grams of butter, 12 eggs. I didn't memorize this, guys. Um, um, I wrote this down. And that came out to a total of um, 44 euros and 85 cents, which for a week's you know, amount of food wasn't too bad. Um, just for a comparison, I ended up comparing this with Monoprix, which is one of the, I guess, slightly more upscale um, supermarkets in Paris, uh, but one you, know, you find easily all over town. Um, and, you know, I... I I didn't order, but I essentially selected the same ingredients online, and I came out to a total of around 35 euros, um, although I didn't find spaghetti squash, and I didn't find, um, you know, the, the varieties of mushrooms. I only found one type of mushroom called the champignon de Paris, which is like a white button mushroom. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if you take those, those things into consideration, the, the difference, I'd say, is, is quite negligible considering that you're getting a local diet uh, from local farmers. Um, and I did a bit of research on this, actually, on these um, champignons de Paris, um, you know, which you would expect um, are Parisian mushrooms. But actually, the world's main suppliers of those type of mushrooms nowadays, uh, 70% from China, 7% from the US, um, 4% from the Netherlands and from Poland, and only 0.4% from France. So what you have is these industrially grown, um, uniformly sized, ident identical looking mushrooms um, are no longer local, uh, even, if, if, even if they sound local by name. Um, so yeah, so I went to La Riche Kidiwi. I went to a distribution point called uh, Gete Lyrique, which is an old, beautiful, historic building in the center of Paris. Uh, it's now used, I think before it was a theater, now it's used as a cultural center. 
Uh, they host exhibitions there, live music, talks, screenings, workshops, and local groceries once a week. And that's where I met uh, Lionel Guérin, who is the organizer of La Ruche qui Divi um, at, uh, uh, at the theater uh, or at the exhibition at the Cultural Center uh, for nearly five years now. And just talking to Lionel Guérin and just being there, I really, you know, I got the impression this is, you know, this real communal feel. Uh, it's this group of volunteers together with, you know, these farmers that come in once a week. Um, it's very colloquial. It's very, very friendly. And what I realized, I think, one of the, one of the greatest bits about doing this diet was, you know, kind of not having the stress of, of, of shopping because you've done, you know, your selection online and all you really do is you go to, uh, you go to the distribution point and, and, you know, you spend 20 minutes there just having a chat with the volunteers and with any of the farmers if they're still there because they usually go back after they, um, they head back after they deliver their, um, their, their produce. And so you do a little chat, uh, you pick up your vegetables and you go home. Everything's already paid for. Um, so that was just a really nice experience. And I felt this real sense of solidarity there, um, a real commitment to quality. And, and talking to Lionel, I really realized, you know, the sense of pride that he feels not only uh, towards the farmers um, and, the, you know, the, the quality and the dedication that they put into, into producing, you know, the, this food, but also towards the volunteers. Um, and it was, you know, it was really quite, quite admiring to see all that and to, to be part of it. Um, so yeah, I think I've pa painted quite a, I guess, a romantic picture of, um, of the local, of the 100 mile diet. But let's, let's maybe get into some of the, the day to day struggles uh, that I faced uh, taking on the 100 mile diet. It's certainly a challenge. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, I'd say the first real challenge is the fact that you really have to let your, your palate adopt to the fact that there's no salt in your diet, uh, no sugar, um, but also just the fact that you, you reintroduce, especially in the winter in Europe, a lot of bitter into your diet. So uh, having fennel in my diet, having uh, Belgian endives, um, having Brussels sprouts, and, and not really having a chance, a chance to kind of, I guess, spice them up with condiments really means you kind of, you know, you get down to the basics and, 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 um, and yeah, that, that can be tough. Uh, having said that, um, it's an experience and it's one in which as well, you have to cook every day. So I, I guess that's another challenge. You have to, uh, cook almost every day, especially if like me, you're not as organized, uh, on the weekends, uh, you could theoretically do all your, your cooking on the weekends and freeze it in or, or, or store it in your, in your fridge. Uh, but if you don't, then this really is an exercise of, of daily cooking. And that's something you have to get used to. And that's something that, that takes, uh, takes some effort. Um, I'd say a third thing that can be a struggle is, is that it can be quite a, I wouldn't say a lonely experience, it was only a week, but if you, don't, if you do it by yourself, you will find yourself in situations, especially think if you do it more for the long term, where you're having to say no to a lot of uh, dinner parties or, or nights out, simply because if you're really committed to the idea of a local diet, there's not a lot of restaurants um, that cater to a, a purely local diet. Um, we've become so reliant on so many uh, spices and condiments and flavors and, and vegetables and meats and, 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 and all sorts of products from all around the world that a local diet just isn't very feasible anymore if you want to be out and about. Um, I, that's not to say you shouldn't try and eat as much local as possible. It's just saying uh, as part of the 100-mile diet, that's definitely a challenge I came across. Having said all that, uh, all in all, say it was a pretty pretty great experience especially in the sense that it really forces you to kind of look at what's around you um get to know some of the people that are actually producing food that's produced around you um being a little more independent and, and reflecting on what you eat and certainly if you have the time and this is something that i really want to do in the coming weeks i'd say it's a chance to go and you know meet these farmers um at the farms themselves and, and kind of see where, you know, where your food is coming from, or at least historically where, you know, where, at least in the case of Paris, historically where the food has always come from, which has been, a, you know, from the countryside of Paris. So all in all, it's been a really eye-opening experience. And for sure, I'll be going to La Riche de Vie again. I've ordered um, my basket for next week. And I think all in all, what you can take away from it is that, um, you know, less is sometimes more. 
In this case, uh, I think it certainly was. Okay, guys, well, that was it for this week. It was short but sweet. I hope you liked it. Uh, be sure to check out, if you haven't already, episode four, where I talk to James McKinnon in more detail about the 100 mile diet. And also, um, be sure to check out the article that's upcoming. Uh, where I talk in more detail about my experience um, with the 100 mile diet um, on the website. That's on www.forfoodsake.me. And of course, if you like this episode, if you like other episodes, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, and of course, subscribe on iTunes, rate and review. That's a great way that you can support the podcast. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next week.